Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Q&A video. If you haven't seen part one, it was posted very recently. Enjoy! Question 17 is actually more of a comical question than anything. It's uh, how many times have your shoulders dislocated? So <laughs> my shoulders were my second problem with all of this. I started dislocating my shoulders when I was 10 years old. I have probably dislocated each shoulder like 500 times, not even an exaggeration. Maybe the right one a little bit less. I got the left one fixed when I was 11 and I got eight years out of that surgery, not a single dislocation, but over time it does loosen up. So the last two years was like a lot of issues. It has dislocated so many times. It requires a lot of sedation and a lot of tugging and pulling and a lot of time. Question number 18 is, uh, how do you face and or embrace the unknown? Worrying about it is not going to change it. So I have a big, like, attitude of acceptance at this point in my life. Like, me worrying about what could happen or what the outcome might be or the unknown of tomorrow. Because I do have so many illnesses that could, on the flip of a dime be totally different tomorrow my outlook is that worrying about something you can't change doesn't do anything but make you miserable in the moment the only thing it does change is how you're enjoying now so i try my very best to just go with it i live in the moment as much as i possibly can and that's a lot easier said than done obviously but that's what i try to do at least question number 19 um asks what the definition of a spoonie is and would i consider myself one actually one of the biggest categories of spoonies would be pots um, patients basically the spoon theory i'll probably drop the link in the description of this video but the spoon theory is just a person trying to describe to their friend what it's like to live with a chronic illness so basically she uses spoons as like all of her energy for the day and you only have 10 spoons for the day and getting out of the bed takes up one spoon taking a shower takes up two and so on and so forth to the point where there's literally you run out so you have to pick and choose what you're gonna do in your day what's more important it's a very good analogy for what it is like to deal with chronic illnesses and I have actually referred to myself as a spoonie for many 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 years our entire community of ehlers Danlos, as well as pots and all of the connecting disorders that i have were all considered spoonies question number 20 is how were you first diagnosed and what are some ways that your diagnosis has changed your life both negative and positive so when i was nine years old i started having obvious symptoms i sprained my left ankle which happens i was a very active kid it wasn't too unusual but then and it happened again and then the right ankle sprained. The doctors explained to us that it was an overuse injury from babying my left ankle, but then it just continued to happen and both my ankles would go. When I was 10 years old, I dislocated my left shoulder for the first time and they told my parents it was from me overusing my shoulders by being on crutches. But then my right shoulder started going and it was constant problems, constant problems. And all of a sudden I'm facing surgery, at 11 years old for my shoulder. I ended up needing my right shoulder fixed only like six months later and after my right shoulder was done, that's when my parents um, started to press for answers, especially my mom. She did a lot of research and she was really like not understanding how this happens to a young kid. My pediatrician was looking into it as well. They were trying to brainstorm together and that's when my pediatrician said he thought he knew what it was so he had thought it was ehlers Danlos. he ended up referring me to cedars genetics back when they had dr ramoyne over there who worked with ehlers Danlos and marfan's patients only pretty much and unfortunately dr ramoyne um passed away only a year after he diagnosed me so there was really no one else left to treat it which made my life a lot more difficult the ways that my diagnosis has affected me it put a name to the symptoms that i was already having so at least it was like validation, like I wasn't going through some wild thing that no one's ever heard of. So that was actually kind of relieving. I've met so many incredible people that have the same disorders as me or have the same surgeons. And my life would be so different without them in it. And um, I'm grateful constantly for like the community, whether it be locally here or online or 
between all of my doctors, like the patients that I've met and the other people with this disorder that I've met have been incredible. My diagnosis impacted me negatively in the way that Ehlers-Danlos especially is not well known in the medical community yet. You're gonna look a doctor in the face and say, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and half the time they're gonna look at you and say, what is that? Or literally pull their phone out and Google it in front of you because that's happened to me. When you have a rare disorder that nobody's really heard of, sometimes they question it because they don't know what it is and there's a lot of like guinea pig experimenting that goes on on a lot of us doctors like to see us do our party tricks like they hear ehlers danlos syndrome and they think like contortionists that definitely was negative with that diagnosis question number 21 is how do you deal with it never being just one thing and how do you prioritize your needs that is a good question <laughs> Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I throw my hands up and I say, why me? And I freak out and I have a, a hissy fit and then I get over it because it's not... There's nothing you can do about it. It is what it is. And it's overwhelming. I try to surround myself with people who remind me that I can get through this one thing too, just like I did the one thing before that. Even if we have to modify and adjust, even if there's new things that come along, there's things that we can get used to. And just because it hasn't been our normal until now, it's things we can live with. It's things that become our new normal, and that's okay. And then as far as how do I prioritize my needs, I'm sure that my fellow DSers and POTSies and all of you guys will understand my answer. It's kind of like you pick something that's bugging you the most, and you deal with that, and hope that you don't have to deal with anything else until that one's dealt with. So I probably need to see a doctor about like 15 different things right now, but I needed to get my shoulder done first because I can't have that postponed again. And now I will probably put off a lot of the other things until they're bad enough that I can't ignore them anymore. And the big stuff that I need to get dealt with, I will do that like in order from most to least pressing. It's not ideal, but that is how I do it. Somehow I missed question number 22 in my first day of filming, so I came back to do that one. Question number 22 was, what medications do you take? Do they cause side effects? And if so, how do you combat the side effects? I take a lot of medications, mostly um, vitamins, antihistamines, heart medicines, blood pressure medication, medication for the amount of pressure that I have like in my spinal fluid flow in my head, epilepsy medication to avoid any seizures, and they all do cause various side effects. Really the way I combat that is by taking a different medication. <laughs> so it's always kind of a double-edged sword. Like for example, my heart medication keeps my heart rate down, but that also can bottom out my blood pressure. So then I take a blood pressure medication to keep my blood pressure up. And there's multiple kind of combinations that I have to take for the, those types of reasons. Question number 23 is how are you treated by the medical community as someone with rare disorders? I have had some of the most incredible nurses and doctors and surgeons who have been just willing to listen and willing to help or who know what they're talking about right off the bat already and I don't have to beg and plead and ask. And then I've had the complete opposite end where they don't believe in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, they think it's a wastebasket diagnosis, tell you to take off your neck brace when you have cranial cervical instability because they don't understand it. I've had just a lot of uneducated doctors, which seems kind of like an oxymoron because doctors are very educated people, but not in everything. And um, it takes doctors to say I'm willing to learn from my patients or no I don't know but I want to know. That's really what is needed for our community because otherwise you get doctors who think that they know everything and so until we get that awareness it's not going to be any better. It's not going to be any different and so one of my biggest goals and my family's biggest goals and even my friends of like our biggest thing is just spread the word spread the word because that's the way that we're going to get the help that we need. Question number 24 is, what's one thing that you wish you could do for the EDS community? And I kind of started to touch on that on my last answer, but really it would just be bring awareness to our disorder and what it means and all of the common comorbidities and all of the things that it affects. I don't think people realize like how widespread this illness affects people's bodies. It affects your skin healing, it affects your organ walls, it affects the way you process medications, it affects all of your joints, it affects your eyesight, it affects 
everything. So it's just like, there's a lot of things I wish I could bring awareness to. Number 25 is how do your illnesses affect your relationships with other people? My illnesses make or break my relationships with other people. And I'm sure that a lot of fellow EDSers or people with any chronic illness really can understand that answer because they've probably gone through it. But over the last year or so, I had found myself trying to box myself up, make myself smaller, and not draw attention to myself. And I stopped asking for my wants because of how much I need. I found myself feeling guilty for the things that I can't change and wanting to make up for that by being quieter, asking for less. And all of a sudden I realized I was so unhappy. And I think the whole thing with being with someone who has a chronic illness is if you can't handle it, don't pretend like you can. Like, walk away. Because we're better off without you at that point. And that's not to dig at anybody who can't handle it. It is a hard lifestyle. It really is. But, like, if you can't truly love me for who I am, then leave. Because we're better off with people who are just gonna leave anyways if they just leave in the beginning. Friends have come and gone in my life. They can't handle the seriousness of my illness, the scary aspects. They can't handle my limitations, what I can and can't do, what I may or may not be able to participate in, the times I've had to bail on plans, whatever. And then relationship-wise, I think it affects the way people look at the possibility of a future, I think. But honestly like my advice to other people struggling with that kind of thing is you will find somebody out there who can handle it loving somebody else should not ever make you feel like you love yourself less or like you would like to be anybody else because over the last year there were several times where i found myself wishing that i was literally anybody but myself and that's wrong and to make someone feel that way because they have an illness that they can't control is wrong and so I think like people that are going through that, I just want you to know like that says more about the other person than it does about you. And just because you are complicated in areas that you can't help doesn't mean that you should uncomplicate other parts of yourself on purpose and like not be true to yourself. Like you need to be true to yourself no matter what and you have nothing to apologize for or to like change about yourself because you're sick. And I wish that somebody had told me that very clearly in the beginning because I would have saved myself a lot of trouble over the last couple of years trying to turn myself into a person who is more desirable to bring up less issues, to talk about my own health even less, to wait until the last minute when it was unbearable because I didn't want it to seem like, here we go again, there's another problem and what if this is the problem that completely wrecks my relationship if you're in a relationship like that it's not worth it i have found that it's literally better to be single and with friends that really really get you and care about you and will take care of you and matter than to try to be friends with people who are gonna dip or be in a relationship that makes you feel like crap number 26 is are there any advancements in long-term treatments more aimed at a cure as opposed to just dealing with the symptoms and so the answer from my understanding is I think everyone who knows about this and especially people who are dealing with it personally in their lives, we're all motivated to find a cure, but there's so little resources going into this. And so right now, I don't think there is. There's something called the CUSAC protocol, which is different supplements and vitamins and things that you can take. And a lot of people swear by it and there's a whole science behind it on how it helps um, the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as well as like the mast cell. I did start parts of the of the protocol and I'm still on them But you have to start very gradually and while you have stuff going on You're not supposed to start like new steps and everything because that can just overwhelm your body. I think as I Heal up from shoulder surgery and I'm hit like kind of a plateau I'll probably start trying to add more supplements and get onto the full protocol but really as an overall answer Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is just a whole lot of maintenance. That's what the course of treatment is. So your shoulder gets messed up and won't stop dislocating. You get it fixed and it's just maintenance. It's a band-aid. It doesn't cure the EDS, but it solves the shoulder problem for now. Or I'm fused. It doesn't cure the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but it keeps that area stable. 
it's, it's a lot of band-aids, I feel like. It's a lot of maintenance. But I'm hoping that in my lifetime, maybe I can say that, yes, there there is a cure. Number 27 is, what were your breathing problems that led up to getting a diaphragm pacer? So, I've not gone into a ton of detail about the diaphragm pacer because it's kind of a, like, complicated and even kind of frightening deal. But, basically, before I was fused, my skull used to actually dislocate off my spine. And all my vertebrae would slide around and dislocate as well. It puts pressure and pinches on your brainstem as well as your spinal cord. And those areas are what control like basically all of the automatic functions that are supposed to happen in your body. I also had a piece of bone sticking in part of my brain called the medulla, which is responsible for a lot of your breathing. So what would happen is my head would slide and I would literally be not able to breathe because the signal that my brain is supposed to send to my diaphragm muscles to make my lungs work would be cut off. So what the diaphragmatic pacemaker is, is they're actually only used for ALS patients and permanent spinal injury, people who are paralyzed essentially. So I was kind of an experiment gone right. I was the first Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome patient to have one place. In fact, I was probably the first patient that was an ALS or spinal cord injury to have one placed. Number 28 is how hard was pregnancy on your body? Actually, surprisingly enough, Pregnancy was really easy for me. I think part of it was that my hormones um, stabilized a lot when I was pregnant. Adrenal function and things like that were a lot better. I was on multivitamins for pregnancy and I'm sure that helps with my vitamin absorption. And when you're pregnant, your blood volume doubles. And I already have something called hypovolemia where I don't have enough blood in my body essentially. And so I think that did wonders for me. I've heard stories of it going either way for a lot of uh, women with Ehlers-Danlos. Um, that either pregnancy made them worse or that pregnancy made them better. But overall, pregnancy was a breeze for me and even my daughter was born with no complications. It was just a very long 39 hour labor. But other than that, I mean, I didn't need a C-section. I didn't have any real issues with nothing like that. So question number 29 is, is it difficult for you to pick up and carry your daughter for long periods of time considering your issues with your shoulders? And the answer is sometimes. Lately I've been dealing with a lot of dislocations and after a dislocation I have to kind of baby my arm, have it in a sling and all that. But I'm was pretty capable of holding her in this arm and she's also really careful like she knows if I have this on it means it's an ouchie so she's really good about that I also have a lot of help so if I'm in a sling like all I have to do is ask and someone will help me and then also now that I've had my surgery I'm not allowed to carry her with my other arm either for right now I do have a weight limit on both arms and so my grandparents and my mom and my siblings and my stepdad and everybody's really helping a lot which I'm super grateful for. Her dad's side actually has her right now because I'm still trying to really recover and not overdo it for the first couple of days. And question number 30 is if I do get a service dog what would I want that service dog to be trained to do essentially like what commands would I need and then also do I have any names in mind. So I think I'm probably gonna start fundraising for a service dog pretty soon. They are very expensive especially with the type of specialty training that I do need. What I'd be looking for would be like item retrieval, like if I needed my medication bag, alerting me to like tachycardia or low blood pressure or even like like epilepsy alerts, not that I have seizures anymore, but just in case that would be nice. Alerting other people, so if I had like an issue where I had fallen or my heart rate or blood pressure were off that the dog would be able to go find someone to help. Also bracing so i know someone who has pots and when they start to feel like they're feeling fainty they have their dog get behind them and like try to sit back they lean up against their dog so that if they do go unconscious then the, they don't hit the ground as hard or the dog will like lay behind them once they're in a sitting position so that they don't like pass out and fall backwards and hurt themselves. And that would be a really big one because that's definitely happened to me before where I've even made it safely to the ground, but then sitting there waiting for someone to come, I've passed out and hit my head. So that'd be really helpful. And as far as names go, I don't have any currently picked out, but knowing me, it would probably be some movie reference to like a horror movie, a Tim Burton movie, cult classic, I don't know. <laughs> it would probably be a movie character, to be honest. Alright guys, that was all 30 q and I really do mean it this time, I am going to try and film more often, but if anybody has any suggestions or further questions for the next videos, um, please, please, I am so open to suggestion, and other than that, 
I will see you guys soon, I'm sure.